Um, before I start talking, uh, in a more formal way, again, my name is Kate, and I'm a Zoom from Montgomery, Alabama, um, and this is the way that you should introduce yourself, and when you come into the classroom, you should write your name on the board, the first name is fine, you should tell the students that you are a student at Whitman College, and you should figure out a way to summarize your course of study, if you don't have a major, just what it is you're interested in, in a way that will make sense to a high school student. Uh, so this will be easy if you are majoring in something like English, or music, or math. It may be somewhat more complicated if you're majoring in something like psychology, or sociology. I have some suggestions. Hello, my name is Kate. I'm a student at Whitman College. I'm majoring in psychology, and that means I'm interested in how people think. Hello, my name is Kate. I'm interested. I'm majoring. Or I'm a student at Whitman College. I'm majoring in sociology, and that means I'm interested in how people interact with each other. Hello, my name is Kate. I am a student at Whitman College. I'm majoring in economics. That means I'm interested in money. Just kidding. Obviously, <laughs> economics. Yeah. economics is the study actually of how incentives are used to influence behavior, but they're not. That's too complicated for them. So just say my money, and it'll be fine. Um, <laughs> that's for you, take. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So. Um, so we're here today to talk uh, about uh, what I think is our most the most complicated lesson of the set that we use, and it's a letter from Birmingham Jail. And um, I had made it I had made it very clear to the interns, uh, our wonderful, magical, highly confident interns, uh, that this year I was hoping that the trainees, in fact, I sort of made it in a set of more strict ways that trainees, that's you, would have read the letter before you came to the lesson. Um, now, I don't want to call anyone out and shame them, but if you are one of those people who has not read the letter or has glanced at it, you're already kind of doing it wrong. Um, because part of the problem, I think, in the past that people have had with going into the class with this text is that they have not given it the proper close read that would be expected in a college seminar. Uh, so you need to roll into Michelle's class with a copy of the letter that is appropriately annotated. Can I say? Yeah. This, without reading the specific annotations, I can just see already that this is someone who has digested, attempted to digest the letter. You should look at what you think are the hard vocabulary words that students might not know and underline those. You should make notes to yourself about parts of the text that stand out from you, and you should treat it as if you were going into a seminar class at Whitman. Uh, and part of that is because the letter is a very complex text with a lot of sophisticated vocabulary and ideas, uh, and you are going to be in sort of a professorial position a little bit more than if you've taught another Whitman Teachers of the Movement lesson, this is not like those lessons. This is not, there's no picture book. You're actually sitting with the students in more of a seminar style discussion that's very much like what you're doing, you do in your college classrooms. And you're engaging together with the high school students around the text in a way that is, I think, very collegiate. And so it's appropriate for you not just to model it, but to think about they are, and Michelle is going to talk a little bit about the way that they will have pre read the text when you get into the lesson. Um, but you need to not only have a visual demonstration, but be ready to have some cues because it's hard. And in, there's a lot of historical background that's associated with the letter. And I'm going to answer some questions from you and actually ask you some fairly pointed questions about the content of the letter in a few minutes. Um, and if you're not ready to talk to some of the students about what's the context, you know, who's the audience of the letter, what else is going on in America at the time the letters happen, why is King in jail? Um, why are these issues controversial? If you're not prepared to do that, then fortunately for you, the internet exists, and so does your college library. And so, as my grandmother would say, it would behoove you to kind of brush up on your history around the letter a little bit before you walk in, because it is, it is hard, and there's very difficult stuff that's happening in the letter, very co complex things. And it wasn't too long ago that the letter was a required reading for all of the first year students entering Whitman. And the reason for that is because it's, I think, universally recognized to be one of the most important texts in American history and one of the most complex. Um, and I've sat in graduate classes with people who still didn't seem to get it. And so, um, you know, if you don't fully get it, that's okay. It's okay, you're working with ninth graders, so you're probably gonna get it more than them anyway, right? So all you have to do is get it a little bit more than them and you'll be fine. 
But I also want you to leave this experience with some more mastery of this text because I think it's, it is so important, it's inspiring, and it helps us reflect on and understand a lot of the things about the civil rights movement that we don't really talk about anymore in this age and time, we, uh, and it gives us a perspective on King that I think is deep and nuanced. So before I start talking about my teaching piece, uh, if it's okay with me, you, Michelle, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Maybe you could come up, and for a few minutes I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your students. And also tell us a little bit about uh, their past experiences with the lesson, and then finally how they will have prepared to interact with the text before they come. Okay. Okay. So this is Michelle. She'll be your cooperating teacher. All right. My name is Michelle Higgins, and I will be working with you um, with you know the lesson as well. I'll be in the classroom. It's a group. Um, each of the groups are ninth grade students um, from our local high school here. Um, they are modern world history students, so we've been covering, you know, 1450 to up until about World War I now at this point in the year. Um, the day before you come in, so Monday, uh, we will read the letter together in class. Um, the semester change is Monday, so new students coming in um, will get to read the letter too. They won't have been left out of a reading beforehand. Um, and when we go through it, it will be not the same as the lesson. Um, but what we'll do is we will read through it as a group and start to talk about some of the themes and some of the ideas that you know we'll encounter more uh, with you as the volunteers on Tuesday. Um, the students, you should see like the copy before, um, like in previous years, we have had um, volunteers bring copies of the letter they in, are. which is helpful um, because it's nice to have kind of a blank slate. Um, but we'll also have um, copies of the packet um, that they will have marked up in like a like a small group or pair um, with a partner um, and gosh I think that's about I was going to ask previously tell us about previous mm -hmm. years and how students have reacted right um, so in previous years this the letter and the lesson has been well received by students um, they are ninth grade, so I think sometimes the way that they read it might not be as sophisticated um, as you know college students or upperclassmen. But what I have really enjoyed um, is seeing them encounter this text for the first time with college students leading um, the lesson because they make that connection um, with you as far as um, being inspired um, to try something like try some learning about history um, that is not just from their teacher. Uh, there's someone who is caring to come into the classroom and to share with them. Um, so I think in the past it might, volunteers may have seemed a little bit intimidated because you're coming into a whole new group of kids uh, for one day, um, but have courage um, because the students are so excited um, to work with you and they really understand what is in the letter um, in, their, in their own unique ways and based on their own experiences and it just helps to kind of broaden their horizons um, and to help them read a document um, that is an important integral part of you know, history and their understanding of American history and history in a world context as well. So it's been well received though, um, and I would just say, you know, please be prepared. Um, that helps you with your own confidence. And um, read the letter, annotate it. Um, you, it's perfectly fine. I mean, look at Spark Notes, you know, online for like different interpretations That's or so deeper cool. understandings. But it does help when you read it because you will be summarizing what Spark Notes. Um, Said. And, and I've heard some of those kind of things before. So again, just intentionally read it um, yourself and um, be excited about you know your new understanding of it as well. Let me ask you a question. How many students are in each of your classes? Um, in between 25 and 32 students, and they'll be in small groups. Um, so we'll be in groups of three or four uh, okay. in the small group setting. And you will, like Kate said, it's a great way, you know, start your lesson introducing yourself. They want to make that connection to you live in the same town that they do. Um, and it's interesting um, to them because it's like Whitman is, a, you know, this 
holy place for them. Uh, and a lot of students haven't been on to the Whitman College campus, uh, surprisingly. And so it's just a great way to connect them uh, with the you know, college students and help them to understand that you know, that's the world that we want them to enter into after high school. So let me ask you a couple of logistical questions. So the students are going to be pre-sorted into these groups, the small yes. groups, or, of three or four, right. you said. Yep. So there's going to be a number of these small groups mm -hmm. uh, and sort of learning areas around the classroom, right? Right. So and we're going to have two volunteers per class. Yes. yes. So, um, what I here's, here's my question is, um, do you think what I'm thinking about this, and we're just thinking out loud here, so bear with me. What I'm thinking about this is um, to have. What if we have the when the assignment is clear as far as, and we're going to talk about the assignment in a second. But the assignment is fairly clear that students uh, will read aloud parts of the letter and then discuss questions that are associated with that part of the letter and then move on to the next part of the letter. Do you think the best thing to do would be to have our volunteers uh, rotate between excerpts to different groups to see how many groups they can cover? Absolutely. So that they would have seat time for a particular excerpt at a particular group and then go to the next one? Yes. Okay. And you will be mobile in your presentation. Of that and okay. so you may start um, and proximity is a great thing also with the students right so you're going to be um, you know you'd stand by uh, one of the groups and you know maybe read some of the letter and ask them to share with a neighbor partner what they think and then while you might start there and start listening to the conversation after that happens and then you can move to mm -hmm. another group and it's it, it'll just be I mean like the direction doesn't necessarily have to be set but just you and your partner know that that's the um, you know that that is a great way to do that yeah uh, it keeps you involved in the conversation it keeps it moving along um, and then you're aware of what is going on Right, so the way that I'm envisioning this lesson is, it, as I said, in many ways it's very different from the other lessons that we do because I'm envisioning you as going in to the classroom as pure, as in a more pure relationship with the students. Um, because, you know, you know, the idea is, my, my concept here and the way that, you know, we've had several versions of this lesson over the years, but as I've become closer colleagues with Michelle, I've been thinking, you know, what makes more sense with this lesson is to have Michelle kind of, in some ways, issue the task to students, which is, you're going to, and you'll pass out the handouts, and they have these, which, you know, we're all familiar with, the excerpts and the discussion questions, and so Michelle is actually going to give them the instructions, if that's okay mm -hmm. with you, yeah. to take out their pre-annotated copies, take one of these handout copies, and begin to read and then follow the discussion questions in small groups. And I think this is cool for you, because what this means is that your job is essentially to be mobile, go between these groups, be able to sit and participate in conversations with students, and you're not operating as instructional leaders in the same way that you are in the other lessons that we teach. So ideally, you're going to get to have some pretty cool possibly super deep conversations with some ninth grade students about different parts of the letter. Does that work for you, that yes. instructional arrangement? Yep. Okay. And also, um, yeah. tended to go along with that is by the end of the letter, what I think um, will also be neat is having that confidence where, you know, you and your partner will, you know, read part of the excerpt and be participating in mm -hmm. that dialogue too, because mm -hmm. it just progresses like that. It just, it's almost like that transfer of power mm -hmm. within the lesson. Um, mm -hmm. So anyways, that's a great way to do that. Okay, great. Thank you very much, yeah. Michelle. Thank you. So does, yeah, so does everybody get the idea here is that we're going to actually sort of let Michelle, you're going to come in and introduce yourself, write your name on the board, and explain your major or whatever, but we're going to let Michelle be Michelle, which is going to free you up to be able to sit at the table with students and be like, you know, here's something that I thought was cool. What's the thing that you thought was cool? And so one of the things you're going to really need to think about as you annotate the letter and, you know, get your mind right is to identify what are, for each, I think for each excerpt, you should come away with like two or three things that are things that you would want to bring up or make sure the students don't miss, or alternately, where you just are curious about their opinion about it, you know, and I, I read this, what do you think about that? Uh, so, so we want you to be not leading the discussions, to, but to actually be participating in the discussions, and if that means that it's your turn to read a paragraph at the table, be like, cool, I'll start reading. 
I think I should indicate why I'm here in Birmingham, since you have influence by the view. And so that, I think, will be really interesting for the students. And I think this may be the sort of final way, that's going to be the best iteration of this lesson that we've ever had, because it's going to hopefully situate you in, in with the students in a way that makes them feel comfortable with you. Yes? Um, is there time or does it make sense between excerpts to say like, all right, let's come back together as a group? No, because different groups are going to have different, they're going to oh, be on different okay. timelines. That's why Michelle and I are saying that you, you need to, you should try to be conscious of being okay. fluid. Um, because group one may get through excerpt one really fast, right? Mm -hmm. But this group over here may be like, well, this is really how to mean talk about this okay. to you guys, right? And so the, so the, so, what I would suggest is that you don't have to sit with the group for the whole excerpt, but what I, ideally each of you will get to, not necessarily every group, um, certainly that one of you will sit with every group for some substantial amount of time. I mean, that's your main, you know, your main goal, but that you will be able to float in and out. But don't float so fast that you don't have the chance to have an authentic connection with the students. It's much better for you to have a real authentic connection you know, with a small group of five students for an extended period of time than it is to sort of say, hey, what's up, to, you know, ten students. And so that's really what we're looking for, is for them to be able to be in dialogue with you. Um, and they may ask you some questions about being in college. They'll probably be too shy to do it and too task-focused. But if they, you know, loosen up later and it comes up, it's okay to give an answer. But we really want to keep this conversation focused on the letter uh, in a meaningful way. So... Uh, does that instructional plan make sense to everybody? Okay, how long is your class period? 54 minutes. Yeah, so you're probably not going to get through the letter in 54 minutes. I mean, that's just real, with the discussion questions that are periodic. I mean, even when we've done this in a direct instruction way, I don't think anyone's ever gotten more than four, three Usually quarters through. Probably three quarters. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that would be great. Yeah, three quarters yeah. would be great. Um, and you don't have to do all the discussion questions. Those are just suggested prompts. Um, you, you, know, you might say, well, what are some, a couple things that are important? And if time seems to be fleeting, you can also feel free to nudge a group and be like, you know what, I'm really curious with the, what, to see what happens next. You, you all want to keep going? OK, cool, let's do that. So we're going to try to get them through the, much of the text as we can, but we don't want to do that at the expense of the interesting conversations that can be had about the text. Yeah? OK, so um, let me ask you a couple things, um, uh, and then I'm going to talk about some teaching skills, in particular the specific to the letter. Um, for those of you who have spent some time with it, there's obviously some controversial stuff in there. So um, before, so let me start by asking those of you who have spent some time with the letter, um, or even glanced at it, or looked at it in a previous uh, you know, educational experience, um, help me by, by everybody telling me something that they think is uh, a flashpoint in the letter, uh, something that uh, either is a really big idea that they want to pay attention to, or a potentially treacherous conversation to have with ninth graders. Yeah, um, I think the religious aspect of it, um, morality as being aligned with um, like God's intentions, mm -hmm. um, can be tricky. Now, say more about how you think that could be tricky. Um, I think it can be tricky because there are a lot of different belief systems that exist. Mm -hmm. um, especially like within a ninth grade classroom where students are still trying to figure out what they think um, is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. So let's say that a student brings that. Let's say that a student brings that up. How, what do you think would be a good way for you to respond if a student is like, I don't understand why he's talking about God all the time. Um, I would say that you have to take it under the context of the situation, like and the time, um, because religion has changed over time and it is probably less prevalent now as like a cultural standard than it was at the time when this was written. Um, let's, let's dial that back a little bit, and the, some of that might be true, uh, but there are some other things that I would suggest considering. Like, for example, what's uh, Dr. King's job? Oh, yeah. He's a preacher, okay. And who is he writing the letters to? The letter to? Does anybody know who he's writing the letter to? Church folk. Okay. <laughs> yes, that, that is true. More specifically, he's writing the letter to uh, other or organized religious leaders who have asked him to basically, can you just pull back here for a minute? This is not the right time. So, 
Well, the letter is, is a doc, it's a piece of correspondence between two people, two groups, I mean, one group of people, one person who are speaking in common language, which is the language of Christianity. And so, uh, while the things that you're raising, you know, may, may be true, you know, I don't know, the, I, I can't speak to that, I think it's important for the students to understand that the nature of the text itself uh, the, the, the reason, part of the reason the text exists is because of inner conversations they're having, uh, people are having within the Christian faith about what is the nature, what's the role of God, what is it that scripture is telling us, the scripture that they all believe in, regardless of whether you believe in it, what they all believe in. Um, so they're having basically a debate within themselves about their shared belief system and what are its limits. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Good question. Who has another question or a flashpoint or something that concerns them? That concerns them. Um, kind of on the same note, I just like the idea of the moral law. Um, that being, I'm assuming, like basing Christian principles, and then I just think if like students ask how what is the moral law, just talking about the whole idea of uplifting or degrading human personality. Can kind of answer that. Okay. So, how would you explain it to a student if I said to you, Jake, he says moral law. What does that mean? Uh, well, I'd just probably follow along in that next uh, in that next sentence to put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas and unjust law. Aquinas is how it's pronounced. Aquinas, thank you. Um, and unjust law is a human law that is rooted in eternal. Well, okay, any law that uplifts human personality is just. So I would say that like a law that allows people to um, live into their full potential or like bring it outside of religion. Okay. Okay. So. One, that, one strategy that I would suggest in that, I think it's good, and here's a way to make it better, is to, instead of, these are students who aren't as used to close textual analysis as you are, uh, right? That this is not, they're, they're entering that zone, but they're still having trouble with that. And so, uh, you know the points, place to point at in the text, uh, and I think it's appropriate to say, well, you know, I was curious about that too. If a student brings it up, say, yeah, I was curious about that too. And then I went back and reread this part, um, and you know the sentence above it, and what that said to me was that there's a difference between just and unjust laws. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you so so try to simplify it a little bit more, and not necessarily quote the text back to the student verbatim. We do want them to do deep dives into text, but this is again since this is really their second read of a complex text, and we're trying to get through that. That's what I would suggest. So I think it's a good question, and that's the way that I would approach it. Yeah. Um, can, can we yeah, we can. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, Doesn't so, ask me anything. Yeah. Um, another question I have is: so there are a lot of things that can like harden up the present day mm -hmm. things that we're seeing, like policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters. And obviously, that's something that we've seen a lot recently in the media. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to know, like, what are some tools to facilitate that discussion if a student does ask about that? Well, students are definitely going to ask yeah. about that. You should absolutely expect that at some point in the conversation, and we hope that students will make the text-to-world, text-to-self connection, uh, and they will, and if they don't, you should ask them, does this, does this, is this relevant to our present-day situation? Um, because that's part of where we're trying to get with this, is not just reading the document for its own sake, but making connections to our present situation. Uh, so do raise that if they don't raise that. Um, what is it, let me ask you, what is it that you're concerned about in having that discussion with students? Um, I just, it's not necessarily a concern, I just wanted to know if there are like specific things that you think are important that we communicate for. I think the most important thing for you to communicate is that you are an authentic human who has feelings and is open to discussion on the issue. And I don't, I'm not trying to dodge your question, no, okay. but I also don't want to put talking points in your mouth. Okay. Like, how, however, I mean, I don't want you to say anything racist. Uh, I don't want you to say bigoted, um, and I haven't not, not yet mentioned, but I must mention that you may not touch the students. Okay, not even to pat them and congratulations. Don't <coughs> do not touch them. Um, and but I don't. I also don't want to program you in a specific direction because I think that would make it harder to have an authentic <coughs> conversation. If you're if you find yourself at a crossroads where you're like, I don't know what to say. You know, I mean, if you decide you want to roll into the classroom and be all, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, hashtag, that's, you know, if it, go for it, right? Like, but be ready for, um, you know, that the students are not, they're not where you are, and you're not going to get them to where you are in the, like, five minutes that you're going to be at their table, so you're probably just going to freak them out, right? So, I, but also, don't lie to them. 
you know, I think that's one of my cardinal principles when I'm a teacher is, you know, don't lie to children, don't soft sell them. You know, if they want to talk about how segregation still exists, that's real. It does. We live in a society that's profoundly unequal. You know, and you can ask them, can you just think of some examples of inequality in our society? And what is it, how do, how do those manifest? And, you know, but do try to turn them back to the text and say, what do you think that Dr. King is saying that we should do about stuff like that, the, the circumstances we're describing? So don't, don't let it get too far afield of the text, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, you know, let them kind of go, but try as much as you can to bring them back to the text because there are a lot of really meaningful things being said about those very issues in the text. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know, we trust you. We want you to have an authentic connection with the students. And so I don't have any talking points. I'm not trying to dodge that. Does that make you feel uncomfortable? Yeah. No. Okay, good. Okay, cool. Can, can I add something? Yeah, to please. Um, Nikki and I are actually in the process of making some kind of, like, document for everybody to have that's about, like, having authentic and, like, uncomfortable conversations. Um, so we're in the midst of doing that before everybody goes and teaches, because we've heard a lot of like, mm -hmm. oh, what if this happens? Like, it, you know, just like awkward things that could happen. Um, and so we've kind of compiled things from like our classes and diversity and whatnot um, that we're gonna just blast out to you guys before you go and teach. So it's some guidelines you can maybe take and, you know. Well, let me just say that I airdrop into hundreds of classrooms all, all year, um, for all levels. And it, I've heard students say, just totally outrageous things. And I have done, just a couple weeks ago, I didn't ask me anything uh, with a room of 150 middle school students. Um, and I had no blackboard, and it was in the gym, and I didn't know they were going to combine all these classes. And they were like, welcome, Dr. Schuster. And I was like, how much time do I have? As long as you want. And I was like, oh, this is going to go well. <laughs> and uh, I was out in the country in Alabama, you know. And um, so, and I was like, all right, you know, here's who I am, um, here's my deal, I've been all over the world, I've done debate in all these countries, and debate's pretty cool, and I got a debate scholarship, and you know, blah, 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 and because they had all done debate, which is the context in which I had been invited to their school. Okay, so, and then I was like, so does anybody have, I want you to just feel free to ask me any questions. And so, you know, we softballed at first, like, why is debate good, and clearly the questions their teacher had told them to ask. And then things got a little edgy, they asked me about my favorite place I had ever visited, and so I told them about going to Istanbul, and how I had this really amazing experience hearing the call of prayer for the first time, and I was, does anyone know what that is? And they didn't, so I described, you know, what that is, and uh, I talked about uh, how people pray five times a day, and they have a limousine who calls the faithful to prayer, and they wash their feet, and it's this incredible experience being in another culture, and they, you know, I don't think they heard a lot of it as long in this particular school. So some time passes, and they ask me about my favorite question, my favorite animal, and so forth, and then uh, one of the students is like, are you Christian? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I didn't, didn't miss a beat. You can't miss a beat. You can't have stage fright with the students. And so I said, nope. I'm not. Next question. You know, what's the, have you ever been to Africa? Yes, I have. I was in South Africa a couple of years ago. Then I was like, ah, the students are processing this. So if you're not Christian, what do you believe about God? And it's like, okay, room of 150 country Alabama and middle school students, here we go. And I was like, well, uh, that's okay. And the, the teachers were like, you can't ask that. I said, no, it's okay. They can ask me. I told them they could ask me anything. And I said, uh, that that's a good question. You may have never met not met someone. But you, you may have never met someone who wasn't Christian, and so uh, it might. I understand why you're curious about and that. And the answer is that I'm an atheist. Does anyone in this room know who an atheist is? And this boy was like, "That's yeah, the person who doesn't believe in God." And I was like, "That's right. That's true." Yeah, next question. You know, it's like, it, you just gotta, you just got to be fearless in these interactions because they're asking questions because they're gen genuinely curious. And if you're not yourself, they they can tell. They're not, and these are these are seventh graders. So like the ninth graders, they get a lot more savvy. On the internet. So um, I, I just think it's important to be yourself. Just you know, think before you speak, but just be real with them. I mean, we live in a country that's got a lot of problems. So just because we got rid of Jim Crow, you know, doesn't mean we live in a place that's equal. And so anyway, that's my that's my thing about that. And so I think we can. The, the idea, over the years, many Whitman students have, have said that they were freaked out that something crazy was going to go down in the classroom, and I honestly have yet to hear a story about when something crazy went down in the classroom. I just haven't heard one yet, and I think I would have heard one, because I always get feedback, and so, 
you know, I think the most dangerous moment in all of the lessons that we teach is the moment where the N-word happens in the letter. And that's the one that you really got to think about what you're going to do uh, when that happens. Um, and, you know, and I have, and I'm also not going to tell you what to do. I make a suggestion, which is what I would do, but I've seen many people approach this differently, is they, remember, they will have already read it before you got there, so they know it's there, yeah? And it's not like they've never heard it before, okay? So, you know, the question you have to ask yourself is, you know, uh, is this a word that you're going to say out loud? And what does that mean from your particular social location to say that out loud? And I totally respect you and leave that decision up to you. Uh, but I also want to consult with your cooperating teacher to see what she thinks about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in the past, too, um, I, I just echo what Kate says. I mean, if you, knowing the context behind that and the painful, I, I mean, yeah, just, um, it's something that you don't have to read. We don't, we're not forcing people to read it. You know, I've had students who have read the N-word, just incomplete, um, in the text and then others who have not um, but uh, I, I've never had any I don't feel like experiences with the letter where it was um, where it wasn't a time for us to talk and learn and, and understand why um, it brings about pain and why it is still relevant to understand why these people don't use that word casually mm -hmm. um, in conversation. Mm -hmm. So that that's you know as so you know again in all of these years we've never there's never been a situation where someone has run screaming in the classroom and um, they're not going to say anything that I'm not fully confident that you can't handle. Uh, so um, but. I just wanted to, I, before we broke, I do want to mention that that word exists in the text. And, you know, he's, it's got a very specific rhetorical purpose, I think, at that part in the letter. And so that's interesting to talk about. It's, you know, he's not an idiot. He knows what's going on when he said he uses that. So that's something to think about and talk to the students about is why is he making this choice at this point in the letter with, other, you know, other religious people that he's talking to. Okay, somebody else told me something else that they, that stuck out to them, or was it a flashpoint, or that they're curious about how to teach? Does anybody have a favorite part of the letter to share with the class? Does anybody know how to pronounce the uh, an excerpt for the first line and the third, the first word on the third line. Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> uh, yes, for the win. <laughs> that's correct. Only because that's what the ship in the Matrix is called. Oh, <laughs> snap. <laughs> that was good. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just reading it now. That's okay. But I guess I'm excited to talk about um, how Gandhi's writings influence um, Martin Luther King. Yeah. And um, I mean, um, and the idea of civil disobedience. Cool. I think. It'll be really interesting to talk to the students about civil disobedience. Um, for many of them, that will be a new concept for them. Uh, and uh, so it'll be interesting to try to sit with them and flesh out that content. What does it mean, you know, what does it mean to disobey? Okay, what does it mean to disobey in a civil way? Um, does that mean that you're disobeying as a, as, a, as a citizen, or does it mean that you're being polite? You know, what are the dimensions of civil disobedience? Do the students check with the ideas? Yes, because okay. right before Christmas, we've talked about British rule in India yes. and studied that. And it's about that three weeks awesome. in, so um, they've written about him on final exams. Also oh, God, that's awesome. This past week. That's really good to know. So that's something that you, where you'll be able to, it, 
See, one of the great things that you can do as an instructor is, as a, as a collaborator with the students is activate their prior knowledge. So, you know, knowing that, you can pull a little bit of teaching magic on them and be like, you know, I don't know that much about Gandhi. Do you all know much about Gandhi? Even if you know about Gandhi, just lies, okay? I know I said no lie to the children. This is one of the good lies. Um, and, uh, and then you can activate their prior knowledge and they'll feel, that will, I think, open up space for them to talk to you and say, hi, here's what I know. And you can, proper, again, bring it back to the text and say, okay. Um, uh, so how do you think that informed what Dr. King is talking about here? So that's good to know. Have they studied Thoreau? Well, in their literature class, like in English, they will, but I'm not, I don't know, honestly, probably not until junior or senior year. Yeah. Because um, they'll do that in like American life. So there'll be a lot of people in the class, that the, in the text, that they just don't know who they are, like Aquinas and stuff, and that's okay. They're just, just ignore that. You know, you don't need to teach them all the vocabulary and all the people. But if you feel moved to say, you know what, I, this guy, Thoreau is someone that I'm actually really interested in, and since you share with me about Gandhi, let me tell you something about him. That would be cool. I was actually, Gandhi read Thoreau's Civil Disobedience right. essay, which inspired him. Right, right. Which is a bit, which is my point, which is it's a bit of value that you might be able to add. Yeah. To say, actually, there's an American influence there on Gandhi, and you know, when you get a little bit older, uh, they'll probably have you read it in, English, in your English class. So that would be cool to bring up. I think any value that you can add from your educational experience is going to be really useful and interesting to the students. Yeah. Um, I, always, I really like the part about the problem being the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. Oh, yeah. Um, just on the idea of like how I think every day there's situations of conflict where you probably could do something, but like stepping in is like uncomfortable or weird. And so I just was wondering, like, should we bring in the modern day connection, like if you, bullying in high school or in classrooms or that kind of thing? Like, yeah. Should they, they be getting more from this text to apply to? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that text itself, text to world part yeah. is really important. And that that's a that's an excellent example of part of the text where you can sort of pull it out and you know, if they don't bring up the you know and it's okay. You don't have to read through let me just say you also don't have to read through the whole excerpt before you discuss. Like if there's part of the text that, you know, is particularly interesting, um, you can you know, if, if they're taking a break or something, you can say, you know, that's a part of the text that really speaks to me, and here's why. And you do that, right? They're not going to be reading out loud all three paragraphs before they talk right. about it. Right, and that's the beauty of being able to read it the day before, mm -hmm. and it's going to be fresh in their minds. Um, and they'll be in small groups, so it's, it's a lot easier to, you know, have those kind of interactions. But yeah, that's a perfect example of something that if they don't pull it out, you should lift it up and say, this is something that really spoke to me. Um, what do you all think about that? Is that something that you know would impact your life and yeah. your kind of interactions with the world? Yeah, yeah. I mean, all I can say about this lesson, the way that it's currently constructed, is that it's 100% on you to you know annotate the text and come up with some ideas and just walk in and be an authentic human with these young adults. God help us. <laughs> and uh, so I think you know I think it'll be good. And again, it, it requires the most heavy lifting on your part, but it requires the least as far as like the you know what we normally think of as teaching, which is the front of the classroom stuff. Um, a couple other things to mention: uh, when you get to the school, you need to try to be there 20 minutes before the class starts, uh, and they, you'll uh, go sign in. You'll get a badge. Uh, they'll probably escort you to Michelle's class. Don't go in until the bell rings. Go in during the transition period. Um, that's why you need to be there so that you can make sure you don't get stuck in the hallway. Uh, so go in during the transition period and Michelle will obviously be there and help you get set up. Um, and when you leave the classroom, uh, make sure that you do a good job of thanking the students for their thoughtful engagement with you. Uh, I think it's really important um, to uh, in some way, I think before dismissal, maybe with like one or two minutes left, uh, Michelle, if you could create an opportunity for the college students to be able to address the whole class, and you, I think they would really appreciate you saying, you know what, we've had this incredible discussion, and um, you should tell them something that I believe is true, that they will have read, understood, and have more thoughtful opinions about this text than many of the students that you go to college with. And that's really impressive for ninth graders and that 
um, you know, you, and I just know that because I know many of your, your classmates haven't even read the letter, um, so how can they have an opinion about it? But uh, I think you should compliment them and thank them for engaging in thoughtful discussion, and um, don't forget to thank Michelle on your way out. Uh, but I think that's appropriate, just like a minute or so before bell time, to be able to speak to them about that. And that will really mean a lot to them, uh, to have that kind of engagement with them. And these are students that you may see again for you Cesar Chavez later, so if you have an opportunity to engage with them once, you'll be able to pick up with them again later in the, in the semester. Anything else? Anything you think I missed, Michelle? I think you did a great job. Oh, thank you so much. I think you did a great job. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right.